good morning, and we will go ahead and call to order the um, December 2nd, I can't believe we're saying those words, December 2nd, um, 2021 MAPS for Advisory Board meeting. Um, the uh, item number two on our agenda is approval of the minutes of our <coughs> November 4th, 2021 MAPS for Citizens Advisory Board meeting. Um, I take a motion. Second, any, any discussion? Moved and seconded. Please cast your vote. Try hitting a computer. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Okay. We've been having trouble with this station. I'll just vote. Okay. Vote yay. Okay. Yes, yay. Everybody All right, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to um, number three on our agenda, items for individual consideration. Um, A is to receive the MAPS for monthly financial report ending October 31st, 2021. Mr. Todd. Thank you, Madam Chair. You have in your uh, packet the financial report as you're used to seeing it. As the uh, Chair said, uh, for the period ending 10 31 21, uh, on the revenue side for max. MAPS sales tax collection is eleven million three hundred thirty-three dollars. I'm so, yeah, and then with interest for total collections this month of eleven million one hundred twenty-six thousand seven hundred thirteen, and for a total of one hundred seventy million six hundred eighteen thousand two hundred ninety-one. Then on the expenditure side, you can see for the month seventy-nine thousand ninety-three dollars and one million one hundred sixty-seven thousand ninety-three dollars for total. Um, we're still showing a minus 4%, but I can tell you that you're going to be very happy with the next report that the, the November check has come in really well, so we are now above our projections. Oh, so we have oh fantastic. Great. And we haven't even completed all of our Christmas shopping yet, so that's great news. Um, yeah. Any questions of Mr. Todd's report? Okay. If not, um, we'll take a motion in a second to receive that. Okay. Cast your vote. <clears throat> I think. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> okay, the motion passes. Thank you so much. So now we'll move to item B, presentation on the maps for operator request for proposals. I think um, Jason Cotton is going to present to us. Good morning, Jason. Hey everybody this morning, happy uh, late Thanksgiving. Uh, we made it to the end of 2021. Seems a little crazy that the year has already blown by like it has, but um, you know, as we were, uh, I was, I was kind of getting my thoughts together for the board meeting this morning. I was looking back uh, to see kind of where we were at in this process a year ago. Uh, and you know, it's kind of one of those things when you're in the trenches every day, you don't realize all the work that's been, that has been accomplished. You know, a year ago, uh, David will probably remember some of this. We were putting together the first blushes of a, of a schedule of what the program might look like. Uh, we really hadn't even sat down and started talking with the board yet about any of the projects. And so we have done a lot of work in the past 12 months and you guys are sure, certainly to be, uh, congratulated and commended for all your work this, this year. It's uh, really been a great effort and we appreciate, uh, the board's support. So. Uh, so our presentation this morning uh, is a bit, uh, as I would, I guess I would characterize it as more of the same. We reviewed the RFP for the Innovation Hall last month, uh, and so we've got some more info, or some additional RFPs for you today to, to review, uh, or for your consideration. And so, um, uh, Carrie, could you back this up? I think it's on the last slide instead of the first slide. Sorry. Give me just one second here. This is a brief presentation. This is not gonna take long to get through. Thank you. Okay, so just as we do uh, every month, just a little bit of circling back on what's happened in the last month. So we, uh, uh, as I have already mentioned, we uh, brought the Innovation Hall RFP forward to the board for your consideration. That went to council for approval on the 9th uh, and was approved. Uh, and so we advertised right uh, soon thereafter, right after the council meeting on the 9th, we had our, what, our, um, what we call our pre-proposal conference on the 19th, and so we gave people that were interested in responding to the RFP 
uh, basically an opportunity to come in and ask questions, and so that was held on the 19th, went very well. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in the month of November, we've continued to work on RFPs. You can see three or four of those that we're working on, uh, or that we've been working on. There are two of these four that we're bringing forward today, the homelessness RFP uh, and the youth centers RFP. And so what we're going to try to do today is uh, really provide a little bit of a brief overview. There are some common things between both RFPs, and so we thought just uh, for the sake of simplicity that we would cover all of those things at once. Um, so I'm going to give you that overview. Uh, AJ Kirkpatrick here in a minute is going to hop up and dive a little bit more into the weeds on each one of these. but. Uh, certainly, we've been working on these uh, hard this, this month. The other thing I'll say that's happened, uh, obviously subcommittees have been appointed, and so that happened on November 23rd at uh, City Council, and so, uh, you know, I think we feel like this is the calm before the storm. Things are about to get really busy right after the first of the year, and so uh, it will be great to have all of those people involved uh, in helping us move this program forward, so we're really excited about that. So. Uh, just a quick uh, graphic, really, this should seem very familiar to you now. These are really kind of the typical phases of work that you're going to see over and over again on all of these MAPS projects. Uh, the, RF, the operator RFPs that we're talking about today are really just inside of that first phase, that operator selection and agreement. Uh, and so we, on our end, really organize this effort around three distinct parts, advertisement, uh, selection, and agreement development. And so there'll be several points in time that the board will be involved in this process. And so we've signified those by these blue triangles here. Um, you know, things will be coming to the board, forward to the board for formal action, being passed on to the city council for formal action. So I think it's important to remember that what we're talking about here today is really just this first piece. Um, we're really just getting started in this process. So what we're bringing forward for consideration is just the RFP. Um, and so once that, uh, Assuming that the board uh, considers that and approves it and makes a recommendation to council, it will go on to council for approval, and then that will allow us to, at, to advertise the RFP um, and let us continue on down this path. And so that's really what we're uh, here for today. So um, again, just trying to give a little bit of an overview of, of both the RFPs that you're going to see today. Uh, you can see here, this is just a really high-level outline of the information that's contained in both of the RFPs. They uh, you'll probably notice if you've read both of them, the, the format, the structure of them is relatively prescribed. It's relatively consistent. The, the two that you're uh, seeing today are very similar to the one that you saw last week in terms of structure. And so um, there's always a copy of a notice, the notice that's provided to um, uh, notice of request to the proposers. There's a section of general requirements that's generally the part of the, the RFP where we uh, basically try to give some context just a general overview of the project, um, uh, the scope of what we're asking of the respondents, um, uh, typically a description of land and building ownership. Um, and so really that's kind of the, what I would say is the meat of the RFP. There's a section after that uh, that's titled submittal requirements. And so these are uh, the items that we're requesting from the respondents uh, in terms of their response back to the city. And so there's a big long list uh, in most of the, of the RFPs of things, information that the city needs from the respondents. And so all of those requirements are contained in that section. Um, after the submittal requirements, there's a, a I think it's a one page description of uh, proposal evaluation criteria. And so these are the metrics or the ways that the proposals will be evaluated and scored when they come back to the city. And so we always try to document those uh, in, the, in the body of the RFP. Uh, and then after that, there's a, there's a whole, uh, there's several pages of additional requirements that uh, I think is largely guided by uh, the city's uh, legal staff and, and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of uh, very specific requirements related to permits and licenses, laws to be observed, uh, safety and protection of existing facilities. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, very detailed language about specific requirements that we need to make the respondents aware of. And so that, uh, frequently appears in the back of the RFP. I think you'll notice that in both of the RFPs that um, you're considering today. And then there's also a section you'll notice at the end on uh, proposal review, there's usually some information in terms of how, of who will be involved in reviewing the proposals. And so we try to document that for uh, all of the potential respondents as well. And so that's really kind of the overview. I, as I said, it's kind of brief. Uh, as we get into the specific uh, proposals, AJ Kirkpatrick will come up and give you a little bit more information. But um, I would uh, be pleased to take any questions that you have in general in terms of like 
where we're at in the process, uh, how this thing's going to move forward in, on general terms, I would uh, be more than willing to take those. Sure. So any questions for uh, Jason today? Yeah, I think the one thing I'd ask, you know, just hearing people talk about this, and there are several people that are very interested in being an operator. And so can you kind of walk us through what will happen at the pre-proposal conference and then uh, give us a little more explanation on site selection and building design? Well, the, the pre-proposal conference is largely, um, usually what happens is we walk, we almost read verbatim through the proposal yeah. and just, uh, it, more than anything else, it's an opportunity for them to ask questions. If there's something that wasn't clear in the document that they're like, hey, I need some clarification on this before we respond. And so that's really what it's there for. But we do just to try to give some context uh, to the people in the room. We generally read through the notice. Uh, some of the earlier sections of the RFP. I, I don't think that we read it line for line, but um, you know, we try to set the stage a little bit and give them an opportunity to ask questions. It, it's kind of interesting on, on most of the uh, pre-proposal conferences, especially those that there are multiple uh, potential respondents, they tend to play their cards pretty close to their vest um, because they're basically sitting in a room with their competitors. But so it's, it's an opportunity to ask questions. A lot of times it's a very quiet room, to be completely honest. Um, your second question related to site selection, I think I might let, uh, I, I think that one is most pertinent, well really it's pertinent to both of our uh, RFPs today, but I, I think we're gonna touch on that in one of the, uh, uh, one of the, the, the uh, presentations that AJ is going to be giving this afternoon. So I think maybe let him walk through that and then if you still have questions on that. It, it kind of varies from- had, David, was just as far as site selection and building design, we learned from the senior wellness centers that we modified things as time went on as we learned more. And is that kind of the process we're gonna to attempt to accomplish here? Right, so one of the advantages we have here is that we're able to pick the operators soon. We can get them involved in the design um, and, and they can go right along with us and tell us what works for them and what doesn't and we're not out ahead and have to redo things. So that is the reason for doing this in the manner that we are. Um, the, the site selection, you know, we, we try to, to uh, save as much money as we can. So whether we're going to be in a park or whether there's some, some land, those are all discussions that will be had with the operators. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions for Jason? No? Okay. Um, I think we have a um, citizen signed up to speak on item 3B. Mr. Washington? You have three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Wonderful, wonderful occasion, everyone. Thank you for the first time. Some of you will get an opportunity to meet Michael Washington in person. I am that guy. No force here. Thank you very much. Well, now, Mr. Todd, you here seem to be uh, on point with projections briefly. I mean, I'm, I'm not, because I know I got three minutes. We are above uh, the monetary projections for what y'all are bringing in. My goodness, I mean, almost made me tremble there. I need to become a little bit more part of this process, it looks like. Mr. Jason Cotton here, sir. Innovation Hall Pre-Proposal Conference. Let me let you know, sir, I'd like to attend that. Is it any who do I need to sign up for that? Because I'd definitely like to give my input, being a community activist, so that everybody can understand what I feel or need, might need to be done regarding my <laughs> Northeast community. Sir, do you mind taking off your oh. mask? Oh, okay, thanks, sir. We're, we're not close to anybody right now, so, okay. Oh, okay, well, I mean, I just, you know, they said breathe in there. Okay. Thank you. But anyhow, I'd like to be a part of this uh, conference that you're talking about pre-proposing, <coughs> and where you again read verbatim, the proposal, since I haven't had an opportunity yet to fully grasp its true meaning and definition of it, to be able to give a real comment on it. So again, I would appreciate that much, again, being notified about when that's going to occur. Now, we're talking about the homelessness um, project, as well as the youth center that's to be developed and the sites thereby possibly being uh, created. Uh, interesting to me, again, first of all, homelessness is a very important issue in my topic as well as, of course, our youth who are our leaders for tomorrow. So again, I'm very in, in tune with uh, that kind of motivation. But there again, I want to know exactly what's going on myself. So I intend to get more involved. And then as some of you may know, I'm pretty much involved in that county jail thing. So it's a lot of stuff I hadn't had an opportunity to really get in deeply here in this regard and this maps for. But I think it's very uh, energetic, very realistic, and possibly something could grow from this. And again, uh, I need to take a little bit more of it, sir, so I can look at this RFP. Mr. Washington, you're at two minutes. You're, you have one minute left. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. And I'd like to get a 
comprehensive understanding from your independent source, your agency, why you were necessarily picked for this project. I'd like to be able to sit down and talk to you. I'm not just this project, I'm talking about the MAPS 416 project, by the way. I'd like to know how your agency, was it a bid process? Did you, uh, you know, did you go through some kind of conference meeting? I mean, what's going on? Do you know somebody on the panel here personally? Or, you know, that's of interest to me as well. So again, I just have, like I said, about 30 seconds here. So I do want to become a part of this, Mr. Cotton. And maybe you can set us some time down and instead of me being a citizen, you mean a highly intelligent person like you would anybody else who make request of you, I'd like to be able to sit down in your business meeting, sir, and talk man to man. <laughs> I'll be back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so moving on to item C. Can I one, just oh, briefly, um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, on, on the youth centers, uh, just to give you guys a historical flavor, uh, people like Tim McLaughlin and Peter DeLisi started working on these youth centers about 2016, 2017, with the help of retired police chief Bill City. Uh, they looked at sites where we had high youth crime problems. And so there's been a lot of work already done on this. And I think the, the great thing about it is that Tim and Peter learned through the studies that they looked at, if we can get our kids in these youth centers between 3.30 and 5.30, as opposed to being on the streets, it will make a tremendous difference in our city. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, anything else? Okay. Um, AJ, so, um, presentation, right, moving on to C, presentation on the Youth Center's operating partner. Yes, um, can you guys hear me all right? So, AJ Kirkpatrick, uh, part of the ADG MAPS 4 team. Uh, so, uh, I was asked to walk you through specifically the Youth Center and the homelessness RFPs. So, on youth centers, um, I have the clicker, don't I? So uh, the youth centers is a $70 million project. Um, the city is seeking the operating partner capable of managing all, all the facilities constructed in conjunction with the project. I wanna point out that that is a different approach than what we use on senior centers in MAPS 3. We wanted somebody who could be a master operator of uh, the entire system. And uh, the addition of the operating partner prior to design will allow them some additional time to be part of uh, the planning and design for the project. Um, and they would be considered an active participant in that process. Uh, let me make one more point on that last, uh, that first bullet. Um, the, the resolution specifically points out that uh, this is for uh, the construction of at least four new use centers. Um, we do understand that there are some proposers that may um, actually be interested in doing more than four, and they're going to have to to spell that out in their proposal, how they would accomplish that. Um, one other thing I'll mention on that um, that we have, have said before, but I'll continually bring up on this particular project, is um, we did not include in the budgets land acquisition for these use centers because in the initial vision, uh, we assumed that these would be in city parks. So if we are getting proposals from other groups that do wish to put them in other locations, um, then we would expect them to spell that out in their proposals as well. So the successful respondent to the youth centers hopefully will have relevant experience with similar facilities, be able to provide programs and activities that serve a diverse population of young people, and have the fiscal and service capacity to operate and manage the, the centers. Uh, they should demonstrate that the operation and service delivery experience with similar facilities and their ability to work co cooperatively with the city and the community. In the absence of that experience, they should describe their capabilities which qualify them for consideration. Um, the, uh, the council did point out in the resolution that they do want to emphasize community partnerships. Um, so we do expect that they uh, should come with, with uh, at least some um, expectation of who they would be partnering with and bringing into these different facilities. Um, so as such, the services and programs can be proposed for a single location or for multiple locations. Um, and some of the early visioning for this, um, we heard some ideas that some of, that they would have the general, the same general offering in terms of services, but that they may be specialized for the neighborhood or the, the sector of the city that they're in. Um, the council resolution does specifically mention athletics, arts, family, health, and educational resources um, as the items that they would like them to consider at minimum, but that they, they are welcome to build upon that. Um, so I mentioned the operational policies will facilitate partnerships with existing community groups who serve young people. 
And uh, they are welcomed by single providers or a multiple provider under a common legal entity. And uh, they could be a mix of new facilities and renovations. Um, we understand that there may be some facilities that are already operating that could benefit from additional uh, construction, um, that maybe there already is the core of the building there and the, the ability to expand it for some of these additional things. Um, so they're um, expected to, to, again, spell out how they would specifically um, t tackle that in terms of new or uh, renovated facilities. Um, and then lastly, the council resolution does mention the Willa D. Johnson Recreation Center. It's referenced as the Douglas Recreation Center, um, in, uh, at that, which was the name of it at that time. Um, there is the expectation that there will be um, equity with that center, which um, should be opening in the next uh, year or so, and uh, that they would be expected to explain if they are going to be offering a, a, a service above what is currently at that, how they would uh, make that equitable to the new ones. Uh, there also is the, um, the, the use of the MAPS-4 trust here. So there's um, $30 million of operation maintenance fund and $10 million of capital improvement fund. Um, they are expected to describe their anticipated annual process in terms of um, how much of that money they would need and, um, uh, in each year. And uh, they are expected to put together the business plan for the first five years um, of operation. And they're encouraged to show experience in similar funding request processes. And then lastly, I think in many of these projects, you'll notice that there is an emphasis on trying to leverage other funds. So they are looking for uh, ability to support the facilities with other funding sources, and uh, whether that be through other grant programs or private fundraising. So the additional RFP details include qualification of background, the financial capacity, program services schedule, staffing and management, business plan, uh, public communication, marketing, and enrollment maintenance, facilities and land ownership, and future considerations. We've walked you through those before, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but if you have additional questions on that, we're happy to talk about that. And uh, the, uh, let's see, that's, okay, so then um, the additional RFP details are qualifications, background of operating partner, financial capacity, program services, and program activity schedule. Staffing and management, business plan, public communications, marketing, enrollment, maintenance, and then quality assurance, risk management, and assurance. Theirs are so long that you have to put them on two slides, I forgot. So um, in terms of moving forward, uh, the uh, December 21st is our um, expected date for consideration of the RFP by City Council, assuming it passes today. On the 22nd, we would be begin advertisement, and then we would have our pre-proposal conference for this project on January 20th. And then on February 16th, the proposals are due. And that would leave us February and March of 2022 to consider the proposals, uh, to do interviews as required, and then to go through the selection of the operating partners. Um, let me stop there. There was the earlier question about site selection. Did we cover for the youth centers what you were kind of getting? Okay. Thank you. All right. So any additional questions on that one? Any questions for AJ? Yes, AJ, Bob. would you <clears throat> would you expand on the advertising process and how it's advertised? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, typically this is uh, posted, and David maybe can jump in because this is a part of the standard process, but um, typically that's posted in a newspaper, is it the general record, um, and then um, also on the city website? Right, and then, then it's in bid sync. So that's the, that's the actual mechanism that the uh, respondents submit their proposals, and it's the same that we do, uh, that you've seen us do for bids for years. And that's a that's a good point to to council member stone cipher's question earlier um at the pre-proposal conference one of the other things that we've been asked to do is to make sure that all the proposals proposers understand bid sync and we're going to do a little bit of a tutorial at each one of those on making sure they understand it yeah okay. thank you Bob, yes yeah would you share with us a little bit uh, uh the thinking about a single operator for all of the centers as opposed to selecting an individual operator uh, for those. And, and for some context for my question, as you know, with Math 3 and the Senior Wellness Centers, we had at least initially separate operators for each one because uh, their location varied you know, around the city, the unique needs of the community <laughs> that that center served varied. Some had medical facilities, others didn't. Uh, and so the identity of the operator uh, varied a little bit depending on the needs of the community and the design of the 
of the center, this appears to select just a single operator to do all of them. Is it because the use centers are going to be substantially similar no matter where they happen to be located in the, the city or what? If, if you would just share the thinking why a single operator as opposed to selecting individual operators would be better. Yeah, um, you know, I, I want to say that I think both approaches have their their, their pluses, and so um, we we did debate um, that approach with city staff quite a bit um, in the discussion of this one. Um, I think on this one there was particularly I think a, a concern about equity and making sure all of them felt um, like an equal experience, and that's going back again to the the council's resolution of intent and making sure that the existing one also felt uh, equitable to each other. Um, they're also, I think, um, we were hearing stronger interest from parties that would, would look at doing in the entire system. Um, and so um, I think that this was, uh, this, this seemed to make the, the most sense for the youth centers, whereas it may, maybe wouldn't have made sense on some of the other projects. Okay. AJ, also one, one thing that we talked about is there's savings that an operator on all forum could have this programs that kind of move from from center to center, um, something that we don't have at the wellness centers now, not that they don't work well, but this was just a, an opportunity to try and consolidate and not have, I, I, I'm not even gonna give you an example, but have this person who does this service um, just there on one day and, and, and doesn't do anything else for the rest of the week, they can move from, from center to center and as, as AJ said, some equity right. in those facilities. Well, I assume a lot of thought had gone into mm -hmm. yeah. that. I was just interested to hear what the analysis was <clears throat> and what that particular <clears throat> approach rather than the individual operator <clears throat> approach we yeah. used. To, to David's point too, Jason was, was, was reminding me that um, also there is the hope that as a system that be able to, to better um, subsidize some versus others and to balance out the cash flow across the entire system. Um, and so uh, one of the things to your question about um, making sure that they're tailored to the individual neighborhoods. I think we're hoping that that still happens, but it happens more through the additional community partners that they're engaging through the individual locations. Um, um, I was wondering, what seems like having all the youth centers have one person, like one... Um, operator. Operator, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, would that, is that gonna stop maybe a more diverse group from applying because it seems like they would have to have a more financial backing to be able to um, do all four at one time. Uh, just a question. Yeah, I mean, I think, that's a, I think that's a very fair point. I think that's why the council was so interested in making sure that there were, uh, it was more of a consortium approach potentially so that maybe there is one strong umbrella organization that has a history of youth centers um, that we're building upon, uh, but that also they're able to still tailor and to bring in um, specific um, specialists on, on certain issues. Well, and, and, you know, frankly, there's a strong desire for there to be, for this to be a consortium of um, providers that, you know, as J AJ is saying, um, that have different kind of expertises, um, but doing, trying to do that in a way that achieves equity across all of the different centers is a little bit of the, the puzzle that we're trying to put together. Okay. And speaking from our own experience as, as program managers for other communities that, you know, have, have started projects like this or considered these issues, um, you also have to consider that there's just the problem of staffing sometimes and making sure that you're getting the right staff because those people can really make or break those facilities. Um, and if in the particular approach that we're taking, I think there's the value of having a larger umbrella organization that in the case that um, the person who's running a particular uh, facility um, happens to step away and, and, and there's difficulty trying to replace them with the right person, you have the, the expertise across that organization, organization to sometimes help um, bolster that, that other location as they're, they're looking for the right person. Bob? Yeah. Yes. Maybe I'm getting too much into the weeds at this point, but uh, did I read in the uh, uh, proposal that uh, we have here that um, there would have to be a single legal entity uh, operating this? So if we did have a consortium, <coughs> would we have to create a single legal entity consisting of the operator and then whatever 
groups were uh, aligned with them uh, to, to operate the facility. That, that's correct. There, there would have to be at least one entity that the city could be contracting with as a yeah, Let me, let me yeah. be clear, though, that, that each of the partners wouldn't have to be a, a partner in that entity. They, they could be subcontracted by that entity, but we can't contract with multiple people as the city. Well, I, I thought I think, that was the case, right. but I want to make think, sure that was a... Bob, it kind of also goes to that accountability piece. We want to, we need somebody, we need that lead entity that, that we're going to look to for that accountability reporting um, for the entire group. So, other questions, comments? Okay. Um, so we have a citizen who signed up again to speak on item um, C3. So, Mr. Washington. Well, my illustrious horseshoe hostess and hostesses. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> I, mean, I must say this is a very interesting point that you brought up here today. Now then, let me say for the record, and for those of you who are in my listening ear here, I do certainly believe that this project can be very, very instrumental in bringing a newness and relaxation to our youth. But let me tell y'all one thing here. I would be interested in operating those proposed facilities. That's right. I have a local nonprofit called Empower People Incorporated, where our motto is change your world, and your world will change around you. Now then, there may be a question of financiability here, but then again, I'm sure that we can work something out since you have all this money to make it happen. Then isn't that correct? Now then, if nothing else, we can certainly act as a liaison to the process to ensure the accountability here. Because once again, we're not saying or uh, belittling anyone to say that we may steal monies or finances. That's not even a question here because I don't know any of those per people. But I can say this here. If you have an independent source like mine who's directly involved into our youth, by the way, I have a youth committee, we're getting ready to do a Kwanzaa event here this coming December this month, by the way. So again, my idea is to reach out and touch our youth for tomorrow, who are our leaders for tomorrow. Now then, $70 million to complete this. Okay, now, consortium, let's put this out the way that y'all were talking about. Put me over it, and I guarantee you save money, because I'm not going to charge it that much. I love the youth. And I wonder if you have gone through the fair bidding process, or do you intend to, under the 1974 fair bidding process, to allow people like myself, regardless of whether you think it or not, I do have a right to bid on it, even if I don't have the finance. You just can't say automatically no. Okay, now, interesting point, sir. One more thing here. You have one more minute. Okay, that's pretty quick. That's pretty quick. Now, the Willow B. Johnson, Willow D. Johnson Recreation Center, right there in my neighborhood. Now, y'all just automatically say you don't know where these centers may be located. Could be in Istanbul. Could be in China. I don't know. I may be stressing it a bit saying that. But I want to know, I mean, where are we? what's the process of that happening? You know? I mean, I like for not, not the Willow Johnson Center. It's going to be nice. But I would like something on the outskirts of Oklahoma City. That way, the children in, can equally have a process of access to 20 power. seconds. Three seconds. Hasta la vista, bam, I'll be back. Okay, to vote on that. Okay, so um, we have a proposed um, RFP that we need to um, vote to accept. Take a motion and a second. Let me, let me say one oh, thing I'm real sorry, quick. Um, uh, just to, to Dr. Bruner's point about um, the, the approach of an umbrella organization versus individual operators. One other thing is I think there is the expectation that um, these operators are going to ha probably have to do additional fundraising. And so in that, in, in that mindset, of course, you might end up in a situation where they're competing against each other for those sponsorship dollars. And we want to make sure that we have an entity that, is, it, it, that really has a, a strong capability and a strong history of fundraising for, for that, pro that program. Okay. Thank you for that additional information. So we have um, a motion and a second. Okay. Please vote. Okay. Mine isn't coming up, but I vote yay. Oh, there we go. Oops. Okay. 
Um, the motion passes. Thank you. I was it, um, user error. Um, thank you. Okay, so now we will move on to item D, which is uh, recommend approval of request for proposals for, we'll go through all that, the homeless development operator ag agreement. All right, so this is the second one that we have before you, and um, I, I will say that this one is probably the one that we were done that, that differs the most from the others in the sense of when you get to the general, uh, the, um, the requirements section, um, they um, are also being expected to answer some questions about their de development capacity, and that's why uh, you, you might have noticed that uh, Chair, Chairperson Rose mentioned it was a development slash operating um, RFP, uh, because more than any other ones we worked on to date, um, we do really expect them to have a very strong role in the development um, of, of the, the, the projects that will come from this one. So, um, the, uh, in addition to that, the, RF, the, uh, the council resolution also um, mentions that this must be a governmental agency, so that does narrow the field as well. Um, the 50 million is dedicated to housing first strategy across the spectrum of affordability. That housing first is a bit of a, 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 a an industry um, uh, catchphrase at the moment. So let me just briefly mention um, this is coming out of particularly a lot of the homelessness planning that's happening across the nation. Many communities are turning to this housing first strategy of the idea that before anything, if we're putting money to try to end homelessness, we need to be putting it into housing first. Um, and so that is specifically mentioned in the council resolution that this is part of a housing first strategy for Oklahoma City. Um, so we're looking also for those that are ability to leverage those maps for, that, those maps for investment uh, um, as, as key. Um, the resolution um, actually takes the, the step to actually name the amount of money that, that, that they're hoping for and, um, as a minimum. Um, this is broken up, the 50 million is broken up into five $10 million phases. Um, we um, also gave them the ability to respond just on the first allocation of 10 million or to, uh, to respond on all five. Um, so those of you that may end up sitting on the selection committee, um, that is something that you're gonna have to be weighing um, the different approaches here. Um, we consulted with the city uh, of Oklahoma City Planning Department um, we, in the recent um, housing affordability study, um, and we, we came away with uh, the zero to 100% area median income. You see that AMI a lot in these conversations, area median income. Um, and so that is further defined as zero to 60%, those uh, either individuals or households that are making zero to 60% of the area median income. Um, where it will classify as affordable housing, and then uh, it was expected that this would also support workforce housing, which is typically in that 60 to 100% of area median income bracket. Um, on this one, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty broad in the sense that we're allowing them to propose on new construction, renovation of existing buildings and developments, as well as additions to existing buildings and developments. Um, they would be responsible uh, for development as well as operation and maintenance. And so you will see throughout the requirements that we're asking them to show their capacity on each of those items. Um, and the city will not be involved in selection of design or construction professionals as part of these projects. That makes this very unique um, amongst the projects. However, as a result, um, we do expect them to give regular reports um, to the committee subcommittee um, the Mass for Citizens Advisory Board and to City Council um, to update us on their progress of, of their individual projects. Um, approval of the operating agreement is required um, prior to commencement of expenditures. We'll see this in several different projects, but this is one where we have to have this operating agreement before any uh, expenditures can begin. And this is one where they specifically mentioned the measurable benchmarks are required. So um, similar to um, the Innovation Hall, we are asking as part of their proposal for them to specifically name the measurable benchmarks that they would like to be judged by uh, moving forward. And the partner is expected to have relevant experience with similar facilities, ability to uh, facilitate wraparound support services. Let me stop for a second on that last one. 
Um, uh, for those that have not been involved in some of the homelessness conversations as much, there is, it's not enough in many cases to just give someone a house, but we also have these wraparound services to make sure that they're getting the help they need to stay in that house. So we're looking for partners that have that ability and can bring those additional partners to the table with those support services. And lastly, the fiscal and service capacity to develop and manage the resulting residential units. So the submittal requirements, um, this one <laughs> does change a little bit from the other mm -hmm. ones. Um, so we have the development qualifications and background section that was added. We have the operations qualification and background. We go through financial capacity, measurable benchmarks, and citizens over, uh, citizen oversight. I'll stop for a moment on that. Because this is limited to other governmental agencies, we do expect that they already have some of their own protocols for citizens oversight. So we are expecting them to not only tell us um, how they are, um, um, are overseen um, as part of their normal operation, but any additional recommendations that they would like to bring to the table um, about how that marries with the MAPS 4 process. Um, then we have some program level information um, that is um, considerations of communications, quality assurance, risk management, and insurance. Um, so that's really kind of the larger program that they're proposing. And then we went down to a next level to project specific details where we're asking them to get a little bit more in the details about any specific projects they already have in mind that they are going to be trying to tackle with, with these funds. Um, there's some additional information and future considerations. On this one as well, I'll just mention because we are getting to the point where they may have specific projects that they want to talk about, um, we did ask them to also um, show evidence of some of the financial partnerships they may bring to the table um, because that issue of leveraging the MAPSOR fund is so um, key to this one. So when you get to the proposal evaluation criteria section, um, those generally mirror the, the section before. So it's qualifications and background, development, operating partner, financial capacity, program services, and program slash activity schedule, staffing management, business plan, public communications, marketing, and enrollment maintenance, and then quality assurance, risk management, and insurance. Um, those are some, I think some, that last one is gonna be a really key one on this one in particular when you consider that they will be managing housing projects moving forward. So this one, assuming that we move forward today, would go to the city uh, council for December 21st. Uh, we'd begin advertisement on December 22nd. Um, we would have the pre-proposal conference for this one on January 12th. And on February 9th, the proposals um, would be received. And that, again, would leave us February and March, similar to the last one, to do consideration of proposals, interviews as required, and the selection of the development slash operating partner on this one. So, any additional questions on that one? Any questions? Bob. Uh, can you give us an idea of the governmental agencies that you reasonably expect to have the interest and capacity to, to be an operator? I'm not sure who falls into that category, if it's local, state, federal, who it is that would uh, likely fit the, the bill. Um, I don't think it's any secret that the, um, the Oklahoma City Housing Authority um, made the original pitch to council, um, so we certainly think that they would be one that would consider this. Um, we have heard of some additional um, uh, maybe state agencies that are focused uh, potentially on mental health that might also be interested in this. Um, so there are other uh, governmental agencies that, that do have a role in housing or are uh, tangentially interested in serving those that need this housing. So um, we, that is one of the reasons we did want to make sure that this went out for RFP. And do you foresee the possibility of a consortium of agencies, or is this likely to be a single agency uh, doing it all? No, I think it, it, it's very reasonable that we could see a consortium. Um, to some degree, it was actually, I think, pitched by a consortium originally. Okay. Are there questions of AJ? Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a citizen who has signed up to speak, um, Mr. Washington. Oh, well, well, they say three strikes in baseball and you're out. I love that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Y'all have me so intrigued in here tonight. Of course it is morning still. Sir, first of all, just a great point this gentleman just made up. There has to be governmental involvement in obvious an operation of this whole development. Oh, by the way, you just stated, oh, it's required uh, by the housing authority. We knew they would make the first pitch. Okay, so that means that they are the ones who initiated this force for a belief that only government agencies, man, y'all, let me tell you something, I'm not a government agent, but that's discrimination, quote unquote. 
that's going to possibly cause a lawsuit being filed to, to disrupt any and everything as far as advancement in this area is regarding that. Now then, I myself would like to sit on this subcommittee that we're talking about. Once again, I would not be toleratedly uh, disregarded, passed over, not recognized, because I do not think that I have time enough now to give my devoted time to these things that's going on that's been discussed here this morning, which quite, again, intrigues me, to say the least. Now then, I would also like to note now, you said about a $50 million increments at 10 million phases each time for five consecutive months or what have you do it, years or whatever. Okay, now that's nice to hear. Sir, I'd like to also be a part of that. I'd also like to be, again, sitting on one of these subcommittees because, again, me as a liaison, sitting back with my hands folded until I see some suspect activity may be going on, this will be the only time that you may see me. But I guarantee you this, that I am very interested in becoming more and more involved in this process because you're talking about my taxpayer dollars, the same dollars that I spend potato chips on and buy a, a tire and want to get on a flat every now and then. You have one minute. I like to know that my monies are being spent and tolerated to the degree that's acceptable to the standards of our society as a whole. Now then, boy, it gets me excited here. Now, if nothing else, I would like to act as a, uh, don't tell the company short, please don't do that. I'd like for everybody to recognize that it's important that I be a part of all this being a community activist. Our motto is change your world and your world will change around you. I have the ability, the capability, the responsibility, as well as uniqueness and intelligence to make great things happen. And it would be a loss, a total loss to our communities and society if I were not included. I say thank you very much and this has been wonderful. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have um, the request for approval of the proposal for the Homelessness Development Operator Partner Agreement. So we need a motion and a second. Okay. Please vote. Okay. The motion passed. Thank you so much. Okay. So moving on to item for um, discussion. Do we have any items for discussion, Mr. Todd? And none from us, thank okay. you. Okay, all righty. Moving on to item five, um, comments by the board staff. Any comments? Uh, uh, comments that I have is that we have a lot of items out right now, um, out for A&E, um, and then you see these RFPs, so we've really hit the ground running and, and we're off to the races now. Ms. Bruner? Yes. Um, I've had a question about um, when the subcommittees will get started meeting and running. Um, Thank you for can, reminding can me of that. We, we will can start, we get a process for that? Or? We will start in January, and um, I'm going to be getting in touch with each of you who are chairs of the various subcommittees and make sure that your, the timing works for you. But right now there will be two subcommittees on Tuesday and, and four on Wednesday prior to the Thursday meeting of this. So in some cases, like this month is a good example, that the, the first two subcommittees will actually meet in, in October. Meeting for, December. For, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the December meeting. They would have met in November. I did this yesterday, too. I got lost <laughs> on the calendar. <clears throat> but anyway, the, the subcommittees will meet the two prior days of this meeting where it's set. So I'll be in touch with you on that. You'll get notices from, from Mr. Beck of the MAPS office, just like you do for this meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Bob? Well, since we won't meet again until uh, 2022, uh, remarkably, just wanted to wish everybody a happy, safe, and healthy holiday, and uh, look forward to uh, moving forward with you again in a brand new year. Well, thank you. And um, any, any other comments? I would just like to say basically the same thing, and um, we're really we're we're off to the races, guys. We're getting ready to get really busy, and it's going to be really great and important work. And so appreciate each of you, and wish each of you wonderful holidays and a beautiful start to the new year. And um, I guess if there is nothing else, we will adjourn until.
to Washington. Ah, oh, y'all thought y'all could get me that quick. Yeah. Hold on. I'm scared. Well, now. Let me keep my minutes in. Okay, go ahead. Let me say again, sir, as you just admitted, Mr. Neelan, it is going to be a wonderful new year. And let me wish a prosperous new year to each one of you today, because I may not see you until that time. As a matter of fact, I may not cross that uh, new area of adventure. God could call me home. So let me just say I'm going to give you all my predetermined uh, qualifications as well as, this is a word I'm trying to figure out. I'm usually not that stumped, but I will do it this time. Let me just say right quick. Let me have a process. Now, I have a Kwanzaa event coming up on the 26th of this month. Kwanzaa is a seven principled program, event, that's geared toward African-American community. But it's not just for African-Americans. It is for any and everyone who want to learn about the African culture. It's based on the seven principles of Naguza Saba, which means in Kwanzaa, the seven principal Kwanzaa, principles of Kwanzaa. And what it does is it enlightens each and every one, every citizen, no matter man, race, creed, or color, it, and I'll give you an opportunity to come out and know about the African culture, the great kings, the great civilizations, great cultures, and great things that we did prior to our migration here to the United States on the slave ships called Jesus, the Carolinas, and so forth, and desires, and all that. It also gives them an opportunity to know that if you come into our community, we're not going to look at you as a downtrodden or outsider, and hopefully that you wouldn't us as well. The point of the matter is that who do you know you can come and talk to if you don't know you can approach them? There are still many of us today who are dealing with racism all over the world today. Just like the Rittenhauer case. Now, come on, man. This guy comes from out of state, brings a shotgun, a, a, a multi-weapon into a city, kills three people, two, kills two, and, and enters one. Oh, he's off. He's, he was being approached. Now, come on. Then we just had the Mon Mon Aubrey case. My goodness, thank you. Have one minute. There is a God that exists today, y'all. We have no room for racism here in America. If your son, daughter, mother, or child was in trouble, and I'm around, let me take these glasses off. If there's a trouble and I'm around, we're going to straighten it out. I don't see color. I see a human being. My repertoire, my behavior mannerism, you know what my only question is here? Is that every person be treated right, no matter race, creed, or color, society, where you live, what kind of job you have, because it don't belong to you anyway. Everything is borrowed because on the day of judgment, we're going to meet our maker. So just let me say this by ending, ma'am, and thank you, Ms. Rose, for allowing me again to be here to entertain you all like y'all entertained me. <laughs> let me go. Thank y'all very much. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All righty. Well, um, Happy New Year. Be safe. And we are adjourned. <laughs>